<laughs> isn't it dirty? Isn't it nasty? You know, so we had to do a lot of education about urine. And so I'm presenting this to these people in Brazil, too, remember, you know. And, and they're getting it. You know, they're understanding it because sanitation, you know, sanitation is a big issue everywhere, especially in places where you don't have the infrastructure that you do in the developed world. So I'm showing the people in Brazil pictures of these urine separating toilets and they're nodding their heads and they're getting it. And so, you know, we did our biochar experiment and one of the neatest things that we did at the school was study Amazon culture and have kids write their own myths and do artwork. So, you know, there's their conception of what Amazon Indians look like. And this is a little story about the pink river dolphin who saves the Amazon by telling, telling the, the man that, you know, the forest is dying, what can I do to save the forest? And the man whistles for a pink river dolphin, the pink river dolphin comes and says, you must pee in a bucket, and then add charcoal. <laughs> And then they will save the forest. So you know, the little kids are writing these Amazon myths. And you know, telling this story to the people in the Amazon, they're, they're really, they think it's pretty good that little kids in the US are studying their culture and, and about the terra preta. And it's all, all quite nice. So then, then, uh, then I just closed my program with the, the folks in, in the Amazon at these agencies by just showing them different pictures of of pyrolysis technology and kind of describing different feedstocks and different processes and getting them excited about it. And as I learned to say in Portuguese, obrigada. Hey, object your pelvic, that's the fair break of it. What's obrigada mean? It means thank you. Oh. It means I'm obliged. Oh. <laughs> oh, that's it. There's any questions? You said, you know, you know, one of the reasons you look for the the terror creates out of it about 80 centimeters down. Was there evidence that that the soil had been dug deliberately to put it that far down, or is it maybe perhaps a, a centuries of, of layering? It had to be centuries of layering. So it, the, the char that's there is actually from slash and burn, or? We, ha we don't know. We really don't know how they made the charcoal. Um, it could have been any a number of traditional ways, maybe. Did you see Christoph's recent talk on that? I Christoph probably started. did. I don't know if yeah. I remember what he said about it. Well, Christoph did work on trying to reproduce territories a few years ago. And he's since been going around looking at current practices. And they range from like little kitchen gardens and dugout canoes that have holes in them to just burning land to try and get rid of the, all the other things that want to grow. And he really did a great job of, of showing a whole spectrum of existing practices mm -hmm. that if you did them over a thousand years add up to this. Yeah, yeah, basically. So we don't really know if this was deliberately created or just completely accidental or maybe it was accidental at first and then, you know, people realized that it was helpful so they started adding it in more areas. But it's, I think it's pretty clear that it was built up over millennia. That aerial photograph of the uh, geoglyphs.
to Alceo, he said he, they couldn't find any evidence of a village or any kind of like pottery or anything that was like a kind of everyday habitation. So they're really leading towards the feeling that they were ceremonial centers or some kind of, you know, had some kind of spiritual significance rather than. And, and they also have not found Terraqueca anywhere in the world. So, but, you know, then there's these really similar things down in Bolivia in a kind of swamp area that's flooded most of the year. They built up these um, kind of terraces for the agriculture. And that doesn't have terra preta, so it could be, it could be, you know. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, you know, you said that, you know, the state of uh, operating is different in terms of how they regard the Why? How, why do they stand out? Why, what are they doing there um, that the other states aren't? You know, I, I can't really answer that question because I was there for three weeks. I haven't really, I just don't have the perspective. I can tell you what my friend Lou has said, who's lived in Brazil for eight years. And I think that the difference is really the heritage of Chico Mendes. The fact that there was a real organized movement in this state to resist the deforestation. And, you know, a lot of it happened anyway, but there was enough of a residue there that you know, you've got international recognition. So, if NGOs came, and um, especially since Lula, the labor government's been in power, um, they put resources there. I mean, they, they hired, they appointed Marina Silva as the environmental secretary in Brazil. And she since quit because she didn't, she thought the labor government wasn't doing enough, so she quit in protest. But, it probably had something to do with her being in the government, in the federal government, so that more research just got directed there. And, and just a consciousness of, we want to do things sustainably. Yeah, Maggie. So would you say that the power of these wealthy ranchers is diminishing over time, or is there any way to Because they seem to have a concentration of power. Yeah, yeah, they do. But Maybe they're just going elsewhere where they have more, yeah. more, you know, power than they do in this place. That leakage effect. Yeah. I mean, they're still there. Wow. So. And the interesting thing is, actually, is that Marina Silva, who ran for president, was did not get as much support in Acre as she did in some other places. She carried Brasilia, which is the capital of the country, the federal employees federal government based in Brazilia, and they voted, she carried that, that city, that region. Um, so the intellectuals who are environmentally conscious have voted for Marina Silva, but people in Acre, even though there are environmentally conscious people there, there's also a lot of people who like the development. They're afraid that she's, she's been opposing the dams and the roads, and they want that to continue. So. It's not just being driven by wealthy ranchers at this point. The development's being driven by the, the average middle class person who sees a growing economy. There's a growing economy in the region, and they like it. You know, they have more money. There's jobs. They can buy stuff that they didn't have before. So. Uh, being quick to toss out theories or hypotheses <laughs> yeah, yeah. on the question of why is it aqua? Acre, uh, a hot spot for people that are, want to take care of nature. Uh, I'd suggest that one bird's of a feather flock together. As an example, my grandfather and grandmother immigrated from Italy to Wheat, California. There's a whole bunch of Italians in that area. They're like they have similar ideas, and they, being similar, they support each other in the culture. Another example, um, college towns, wherever I go. I always like college towns because coffee shops, there's an intellectual thinking, there's similar things, things that make me happy, so I feel really comfortable around college towns. Again, birds of a feather flock together. Yeah. And Rio Branco is a college town. Pardon me? There's a, there's a university. Yeah, so that's a big part. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and one more uh, example, um, Northern California, uh, Soul Fest, uh, 
Hopland, I always see as like a hot spot of environmental people. It's just one of the Marin County, which is kind of a hot spot for environmentalists. Uh, just a food for thought. Sure, yeah. yeah. Okay. Can I come back to the Ontario Crater just comment yeah, yeah. to your question? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's two types of songs, Terra Crater and Terra Marana. And the Terra Crater is clearly a million songs because of the very small poverty shots. And the people had a lot of managed libraries. They had a very thatch they, they had their refuge, refuse, which uh, uh, would have packages. And I think they met the dealing with the system that they uh, whether if they deliberately go into the soil just for the mid soil to pick up is debate. But the terra mulata soil, which occurs outside of the ground, that was clearly deliberately developed for the So it seems to me that uh, for Christoph, Christoph, as Jim said, we started looking at the practice, it still existed in the village this area. And interestingly, they combine everything together to make their compost. And they still cook the compost. They still go still do it. And it's occurring right between the, the house and the, mm -hmm. and the village. So yeah. around the world, this practice is occurring. And we take to uh, really build that. One reason why it might have really the accumulated there is because they didn't have that much dry land. Yeah. You know? So there are all these riverbanks and the whole area gets flooded in the wet season, so they just didn't have that much land. They had to concentrate their activities. Yeah, that's a good point. There's a few islands of raised land, and it's just flat. And that's where the actual habitation is. Yeah. He, he could also show that if he were going to try and grow you know, any kind of kitchen garden, in that area would not can grow a ground. He said that the soils are so acidic and kill things and there's so many pests and things that they feed us that the only way to this day that people grow in vegetables is they have you know, like a canoe or some sort of platform yeah. up off the yeah. ground and they're making soil by like putting stuff in the way. Some of the pottery shards are clearly from very large pots. So they might have just been growing food in, big, big, in really big pots too. Anybody else? We should give this projector a rest. Yeah. <laughs>